Hello, everybody. Welcome to Better Together. When you know better, you get better. It is Tuesday, October 6th, 2020. Our quote of the day comes from our guest today. It's easy to be liked by strangers. It's very hard to be loved and connected to the people in your home when you're always bringing them your most exhausted self and resenting the fact that the scraps you're giving them aren't cutting it. Ooh! Damn, Shauna Nequest, our guest today, she's the New York Times bestselling author of Present Over Perfect, leaving behind frantic for a simpler, more soulful way of living. The foreword is by our favorite, Brene Brown. Um, so excited to chat with her today. Um, in the meantime, thank you guys for joining us. As always, if you haven't clips, clicked subscribe on YouTube, please help us and help yourself so you can get all the notifications so you never miss an incredible episode. Uh, follow us at Better Together with Maria on uh, social media. Yes. Yes. Kelsey's all over that. Uh, and if you haven't joined us on Patreon, please do. Along with the ad-free content, um, your investment there will also bring you more content, exclusive content that we do there, and these incredible exclusive workshops that we are just starting to curate with our guests. So you have access to the amazing guests you get to see on the main show. Um, you actually have access to them in these workshops. And so we're really excited. Tomorrow night we're doing Catherine Woodward Thomas, finally, finally. after our power outage <laughs> issues. Um, so we're going to do these guided meditations to help you with triggering emotions and a Q&A with her. So um, these are invaluable experiences that you just would not have access to otherwise. Um, and sometimes these people do tour the country, but there's thousands of people in the audience. So, you know, you really have... A shot in the dark. That's right. Well, and you get to spend it. Jeff and I keep saying this, but they get to spend it with you too. So how cool that you get to meet Maria as well as our guest, whoever is on the show that day. Mm -hmm. I just think that's really incredible and something to be really excited about. Yeah, we had a lot of fun in our first yeah. one, so I'm excited. So much fun. I was really yeah, sad was last week. I know. I know. And I want to say to our audience, if you guys don't believe that Maria is like fighting for this show. Both Catherine and her were like, how can we make this work? <laughs> yes, there was a huge storm. And yes, California's on fire. But like, we'll figure this out. And we at a certain point, we were like, guys, let's wait a week. Because we don't want to yeah. cheat you guys out of the full potential right. of the event. Mm -hmm. So we're like, let's wait. Let's do it right. So that's mm -hmm. going to be happening tomorrow. Yeah. Exciting. I'm really excited. Um, so can we talk American Murder? Ooh. Is that the name of the documentary? Yeah. American Murder? American Murder. Okay, Jeff, you saw it, right? I made sure to watch um the social dilemma but i haven't watched american <gasps> murray yet but it's Jeff. on the list for laura and i i know no kelsey if we're gonna talk about stuff you gotta make sure he's watched it i told him but i can't go into his house and jeff but you gotta say jeff maria's going to <laughs> jeff maria really says your you take <laughs> well i know i'm in trouble i'll make sure i think it's on the docket for laura and i to watch tonight so dang, i'll make sure that jeff. Ugh, you know, there's Jeff. another one. So uh, my friend Rita, I mentioned yesterday, her mom just got diagnosed with ALS. And um, ugh, actually, you know, it's really crazy. So she deals with brain injuries every day. That's mm. her job. Oh, wow. And so when my mom, I remember, I think it might have been her two year anniversary. We had a party here. She was here. And I was really frustrated. And I was really just so sad and there were certain like behavioral things mm. my mom was doing and I was just so confused and it was not her mm. and she just kept saying to me she's like Maria she's not doing this on purpose she doesn't know she would never do this to you guys you I, I know your mom from growing up and you know your mom and she would never and I'm like but she knows what she's doing and when you're dealing with the brain it's so confusing you guys it is really such a mind f yeah right because you watch them and mm. you know they know what they're doing but then so then your rational brain is like oh my god she's doing this on purpose right 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 so i remember her and i try to carry that through this journey when she told me that so i just saw her the this past weekend and we were talking about her mom and she was like maria when i think of like the worst things i deal with it's like als and brain cancer are the worst mm. right she's like and mm -hmm. we're just the unlucky ones that are having to deal with this and we were talking about 
uh, she mentioned this thing called like impulsive, impulsive um, behavior or impulsive something. And she said there are people with these different diseases where they can't even control their actions, right? Like I know Parkinson's, like we know because Michael J. Fox right, has been so right. gracious to share his journey with us, yeah. right? So there's impulsive behaviors. Mm -hmm. And so it clicked with me in that moment. Oh my God, that's why my mom gets up when she knows she's going to fall. And so the last time she fell, Kevin said to her, he goes, Lisa, I don't know why you keep doing this. And she goes, I don't know why I keep doing this to myself, Kevin. I do. I know better. Wow. And so I was like, well, if you know better, do better, mom. <laughs> Come on, mom. <laughs> if you know better, get better. But now I understand. Wow. And that's why conversations with people outside of your circle sometimes are so, like Rita and I are friends, but we don't talk mm. often. Like we mm -hmm. talk through another friend. And, and it was so great that she shared that with me because now I understand it's like this tick right so mm. she doesn't know better right. really like she can't she can't control she the can't tick control in it. a sense right. right so when she would walk to the bathroom she would detour all the time and start like wiping the counters with her hands mm. and turning the sink mm. on and doing all these things so that's her old body and brain remembering what she would do back then right. like when she was able and right. not having brain injuries let's say and so we would be like, mom, we're going to the bathroom. You don't have to clean the counter. Like, don't worry about that. But our rational She's brains programmed. couldn't understand mm -hmm. why she was doing that. We would get frustrated. So now, and like, you know, we'll all kind of look at her and we're like, we know she knows what she's doing. Why is she doing this? Why is she making us suffer? Mm. But she can't. Yeah. And so now I know better. I can do better and I can have more patience in these moments um, and I say that in case anybody else is dealing with anything like that out there, especially with the brain, because it is so challenging, even with all the research, all the work I do, all the studying, I never saw that. I never mm -hmm. heard that. Mm -hmm. And no doctor has ever brought that up to me, right? Yeah. Because they're not dealing with them on that level. So like Rita is dealing with them in the physical therapy level. So she gets to see all these things in a different way. So it's been really fascinating. Anyhow... There was a whole point to what I was talking about um, with her mom and the ALS. Oh, she we were talking about this conversation, and she brought that up. I think that's really why I detoured into this. <laughs> I like you it, know, When I think about your mom, Maria, I know you and Kevin are planning on eventually having a family of your own, mm -hmm. and it's going to make you such a better mom because, really, you've had to become the so your true. mom to your own mom and, like, mm -hmm. dealing with the frustrations and having that empathy of, you know, Maybe she, quote, disobeyed in this moment, but there's a greater reason. Mm. I feel like those tools are going to be so valuable when you parent. I hope so. So true. But, you know, it was funny. We also were talking, Rita and I, when you're first generation, you're always the parent. Mm. We've always been the parents. Yeah. I ran my household from yeah. the time I was little. Right. I was in charge because I was the translator and I, you know. Laundry. Everything. I, I, I had to do all of that. Mm. And so you have a different role in your family from kind of go for the most part. Yeah, right. And I've definitely talked to enough first generationers to know. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's really painful when you, um, when you don't know. And now when you know, then you feel so guilty. Right. So like I lost it at lunch. I was like, oh my God, I've had, whew, I mean, no one's going to be perfect, right? So you have to have empathy for yourself. Yeah. But it's really challenging to deal with this stuff. Yeah. Um, so I'm grateful that I'm having this time away to have these kind of revelations. revelations yeah. And then I can go back and be better. Um, well, and I also think it's like, of course, it makes you emotional because you like you said you want her to be better right so it's like if you see her doing these things that are going to hurt herself mm -hmm. like hurt her you're like mom you know better like yeah. you you know better than this yeah so but you can't help it but you can't help it yeah right so yeah. it's like don't beat yourself up because you want what's the best for her mm -hmm. i mean it's all a learning the other thing that's interesting too for anybody who's a caretaker out there is and the reason why you need to get some distance at times is so that you can have these kind of breakthroughs so mm. um i'll give you them as 
often as I can. But one of the things that I've noticed too is there is a gap between what I want from her for her and where she's at always. Mm. So I'm always trying to hang on to like, I was trying to hang on to her mobility. Mom, please, you've got to keep moving. If you stop moving, you're not going to be able to move anymore. Okay, Maria. And then she wouldn't. I'm like, mom. And I would do everything I could. I would try to bribe her, whatever it took. Mom, please, you've got to keep moving instead of seeing her for where she's at. Mm. So what I've realized is there is that gap. I'm trying to like desperately fight to keep her stronger longer Mm. and I have to I have to give in to the realities sometimes right so like sometimes you have to just surrender rather than trying to push something that either her body isn't capable of doing or her brain and her body aren't communicating and and it just is what it is Mm. So that was a lot of source of frustration too, because I would be so upset that she didn't want to push harder because I know what's coming if she doesn't, right? Right. And her brain, maybe she doesn't get it. Um, So that's like another thing that I've, I've realized is you have to kind of, you push as much as you can for their greater good, but at some point you have to take a step back and just say, okay, here's where we're at. It sucks. Mm -hmm. Um, But now how do we deal with where we're at? And so Kevin was already there because it's different when you're not. It's your mom. It's my mom and I'm desperate. So I feel like um, he was already like, Maria, he's like, we have to go into baby mode. We have to Mm -hmm. baby her. It's not Mm -hmm. about trying to push her anymore. It's about babying her. And so, and to me, that just obviously just sounds like an end you know so I'm like no (laughs) we're gonna push we're gonna push but um it's crazy crazy journey um I mean we're super blessed that we've had as much time as we've had and I keep one of the things I told Rita because when you get an ALS diagnosis and the the level that her mom's is at is really the devastating one Mm. and I've guttural cried for her just knowing how painful that journey is going to be um You know, the the hard thing is, is that I lost my train of thought. Shit. (laughs) (laughs) The hard thing is you lose your train of thought when you get so emotional. Right. Um, What I said to her is that you have to, you know, you have to let them have their journey, which I learned from Judy, who was on our show. Um, She had told me that with my mom the second time around. I wanted to protect my mom and not tell her. Mm that the tumor was back and she was like you're robbing her of her journey right wow. it's her journey it's not yours you're helping her on the journey and I was like oh, that oh. Gives me chills. yeah so yeah. and Rita was doing the same mm-hmm. thing and so I was able to share with her where I was at and say you know our parents are stronger than we believe sometimes mm-hmm. and we're terrified of the pain we're gonna feel seeing them in pain so in essence it's a bit selfish right and and I've done it. I did. I've at moments I've I've not been super one hundred percent honest to protect them. But at the same time, who are you doing it for? You're doing it for, for you. you. Yep. Just as much as you're doing it for them. And really if something's to happen, you want them to have the journey the way they wanted it, to yeah. go where they wanted to go, to see who they wanted to see, say what they wanted yeah. to say. So I was able to kind of help her through that. So it's been interesting, like we're both kind of helping each other. Mm. Because she's giving me these like eye-opening kind of moments where I get to see things through a different lens. And then I'm able to share, because I'm ahead of the curve, because I've been dealing with this for so long. I said, you have to start preparing to be mourning her while she's alive. Mm -hmm. That was a big thing that hit me maybe in the beginning of COVID or something. I Or at some point recently, Kevin was like, Maria you're devastated because you're mourning her while she's alive. It's a slow morning and you're like, oh, okay, that's why I'm so down. I didn't, I didn't get right. it. And then the last thing I said was, you have to love yourself and take care of yourself as well. Obviously, I've talked about caretakers getting sick, taking care of the sick. But the example isn't just how you're going to deal with crisis, right? Like I decided to choose laughter and humor for my brain tumor journey, right? It's not just how I'm going to deal with it. 
it's how, you know, it's like for, for, let's say like my friend, it's not just how her mom's going to handle it. It's how she's going to handle taking care of her, but also loving herself too Mm. and not self-destructing. Cause what I I see so many people do is self-destruct and, and just let themselves go in the name of I'm taking care of someone. Right. And that's not the right thing to do either. Right. And that person wouldn't want that either. Yeah. So I said, the true lesson is in how are you going to handle this journey and set the example for people around you? Are you going to let yourself run into the ground and show people that that's the way you do it? Mm. Or are you going to show that you have compassion and love for yourself too? Mm. Just like the patient you're taking care of. Oof. Yeah. So wise. I think... You know, I think that's just so wise, Maria. And the episode I think of that I'm going to prescribe for you, even though it's uh-huh. one of your episodes, <laughs> is the Elizabeth Gilbert episode. It was one of the first episodes I got to produce with this team. And I don't know if you remember, Elizabeth Gilbert, widely celebrated thought leader, author of Eat, Pray, Love, had to watch her own partner slowly die. Mm-hmm. And she said, like, I'm the celebrated lecturer, a beloved New York Times bestselling author, and I'm a pretty bad caretaker. And I learned so much about caretaking through this. and. I just think what you're saying is really wise and echoing a lot of what she said in that episode as well. So uh, just having grace with the person and having grace with yourself Mm -hmm. is just going to make the journey easier. And I think you should go back and listen to that episode. I will. I will. Absolutely. I'll listen with uh, you. Yeah. It's just important stuff and people don't talk about any of Mm -hmm. this stuff and people don't talk about, like we said in one of the episodes recently, how to show up for people who are in crisis. Yeah. Right. And you know, it's it's always so interesting when people are like, you know, family will be there, family will be there, and you're like, okay, cool. Mm-hmm. Need you, need you. Hello, yeah. Hello, can hi. Can... Yeah, and, and you're not even asking for a lot, but no. it's like, it's really hard on this end, but then on their end, I get it. People can't get out of their own way. Yeah, everyone is dealing with their own messes whatever their messes are so it's super hard so it's like uh, so you're lucky if you have one or two people in your life that are just like my cousin Nikki's amazing she comes down she'll take my parents out she'll bring them lunch she'll bring them food flowers gifts like the whole thing like she goes over and above to let them know that they're not alone and they're loved and they're special like you know all those things and so you know, if you have one, great, be gracious, uh, grateful. And if you've got more than one, then man, you've really won, I feel like. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. So, <clears throat> all right. Let's get to our conversation Yay. with Shauna Nequest. She is a best selling author, lecturer, and thought leader in contemporary Christianity and spirituality. She has shared the stage with so many impressive peers like Oprah, Brene Brown who we are desperately trying to get on this show. A former guest of ours who we love, Glennon Doyle. Speaking of Glennon, she cried tears of relief while reading Shauna's most recent book, Present Over Perfect, which stresses the importance of leaving behind perfection to embrace the simple beauty uh, of, of, to embrace the simple, the beauty of simply being alive. Damn, (laughs) I've like lost my train of thought. (laughs) Right here and right now. Um, so everybody, welcome Shauna to the show. How are you? Hey, thanks for having me. Of this course. I'm so excited to talk to you. I feel like um, we should probably start with your story that got you to uh, presence in your own life. And obviously now you're, you know, sharing it with everybody else. Uh, there was a season several years ago where I think like if you and I had gone out for coffee and you would have and you would have asked me what really matters to you most, I would have said, oh, you know, obviously my faith, my family, my marriage, my kids, um, really being deeply connected to the people I love, making memories. I would have told you all of these things. But if you looked <clears throat> at the actual day to day of my life, I think you would have seen that what mattered to me essentially was like work and hustling and running errands and being busy all the time to reach some sort of imaginary place where I finally had done enough. Mm. I pushed myself for so many years um, for all sorts of reasons. And then I got to a point where I said, wait a minute, my life doesn't actually match my values 
anymore and I'm not the person I want to be and I need to make some changes. So how did you get to that place? Because for me, it was a brain tumor. You know, I think uh, obviously there are invitations all around us Mm -hmm. and something like a brain tumor is such a, a dramatic invitation. And I'm so glad that you're doing well and that your health is thriving and um, what an enormous thing to enter someone's life. Um, I had nothing so dramatic. Um, <laughs> I, I feel like there were just little whispers everywhere, you know, but I didn't listen to them mm-hmm. because I was too busy. So I didn't listen to the whispers and then I didn't listen to like the regular voice and then I didn't listen to the shouting and then I didn't listen to the screaming. And then uh, I finally started to pay attention when it was like I couldn't hear or feel anything. Mm. I was so exhausted and so kind of burned out on such a deep level that it felt like I was watching my actual life from behind a thick pane of glass. Does that make sense? Yeah. Wow. That is such a great description. You know, we get so wrapped up in the rat race of life right and especially as women we have to be everything to everyone and we're nothing to ourselves and I feel like it really is just about our to-do list every day it's like we got to get it done we got to get it done and are you are you help me get done honey no okay now we're gonna f- you know stressful moments with each other because I gotta get it done why aren't you wanting to get it done because we're obviously very different um and And yeah, I talk about all the time, I was moving so lightning fast that I wasn't hearing any of the whispers, screams, punches to the face, kicks to the gut until, you know, God was like, okay, let me body slam you with a brain tumor and let's shut this down because you have a journey you need to go on and you're not listening. And so I applaud you for not having to get ill. A lot of people have to get ill to have that moment. Um, So... At what point and how were you able to realize that your life didn't align with your values? Because I think that's so fascinating to look at it like that. I think um, I started to really, I mean, you notice anything. You, A friend of mine, a mentor of mine who's so wise, always says that none of us, well, very rarely, do you change your life until the pain level gets high enough. Mm-hmm. And so I started to experience that kind of pain or friction in all different areas of my life. My health was not great. I was not sleeping well. I couldn't manage my weight. My marriage was not where I wanted it to be. My parenting was not where I wanted it to be. My work life felt pretty like hollow and frantic. And it it, it took some honesty on my part to say, this might look okay from the outside, but on the inside, things look really, really bad. And I think I just got, uh, one of the things I think that's also helpful sometimes is to pay attention to what makes you jealous or envious. Ooh. So, and so what I realized was I wasn't looking at like, let's say people who were selling more books or people who were speaking at more events. I was like desperately uh, jealous of people who like slept a full night's sleep or sometimes took naps, or people who talked about their lives feeling like sort of light and um, right-sized, and people who weren't complaining about being tired and busy all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, that's kind of a, that's a signal right there, you know? I wanted their life, Mm -hmm. and it didn't look anything like my life. So I think paying attention to the people that make you jealous can sometimes show you what it is you really desire. Oh my God. I mean, it's so obvious but but not right like even this past weekend i had a moment where i just was like on a walk i really love like having neighborhoods and talking to neighbors so i have neighbors on both coasts that i love and i i've made an effort to know everybody um so i was walking down the street and you know this neighbor's dog that i love i was playing with him on the lawn and the kids were out and they were riding the tractor and climbing trees and i was like that's the life i want for my kids right when I have them. That's what I want. I want peace. I want simplicity. I love driving my parents' minivan and having a simple life. Like it's just where what I'm wearing doesn't matter, where things I'm driving don't matter, just the simplicity. I mean, listen, I love great things. Of course, everybody likes nice things, but I don't need them. I need my sanity and my inner peace. And so I think that's such a great tip to really look at 
what is making you envious? Because one of the things that I've always had envy over is people who can just have fun on the weekends and like live life. I didn't know how to do that because I was so stuck in work, 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 that even just now being here in Connecticut over the last two and a half, three months, I'm realizing that's what I've been missing. Those friends where you can just be like, hey, let's go apple picking this weekend or let's just hang out and watch a movie. I didn't have that life in LA. In LA, it was all work events, industry events. We're going, we're going to be seen. We have to dress to the nines. I was so exhausted by that lifestyle. Um, Having a smidge of it is fine, but having it be your everything 24 seven, it's just too much. I I mean, I can't imagine, but I, I do know that in my life, part of, you know, part of my work life was I worked weekends every weekend for years. And I think sometimes maybe there were people who looked at me and they were like, wow, what like a cool fancy job. But I was doing exactly like what you were saying. Like, I want to go apple picking. I want to like play in the yard. I want to wear like my jammies till noon. (laughs) And those are good signals to pay attention to um, because they'll lead us to our true desires. Even though obviously we live in a culture that says, you know, work is so valuable because, and also because work makes you important and work lets lets you buy fancy things. And that's what we should all want. But I think under that cultural messaging of work and buying and spending and accumulating, if we can get out from under that voice, if we can turn down the volume of that voice, we find that a lot of times what we want is a lot simpler than Mm -hmm. that, uh, is a lot less expensive than that, is a lot less flashy than that. And I think those are the voices that are really worth listening to. Yeah. Well, you are such a great example of that because you're you and your husband and your family moved from the burbs to the city in New York. You downsized to the teeniest little space. (laughs) That is true. (laughs) And so I'd love for you to share with people the motivation behind that and the pros and cons because right now I feel like everyone's doing the opposite everyone's like get out of the city move to the burbs need land need yard need all of this stuff because we're going to be stuck at home and you guys did the complete opposite well I mean (laughs) certainly we didn't realize we would be spending quite as many hours in the apartment (laughs) as we are obviously but you know good point um, the decision was pre-COVID right right yeah um sometimes when people ask like what on earth are you doing here like why did you move to New York when you were like 42 years old? And sometimes the way I explain it is I moved for love um, because my husband uh, has been wanting to move for 10 years. We both grew up in the same hometown, lived in the same hometown for a long time. And for the last 10 years, every year he asked me, is this our year for an adventure? Is this our year for an adventure? And every year I was like, do you mean a trip? (laughs) <laughs> it was like, I don't. You're like, please, like dear trips, God, but... mean a trip. <laughs> right. I'll even do two. Totally. And I love to travel. So that part always felt fun. But I really, I, I think I had a pretty deeply embedded idea of what our future was going to look like. And it was going to be in our hometown with our extended family, with our old friends. Um, I, like I thought I knew what the future looked like. And right, famous last words. Um, he kept saying, I think there's another way for us to live. And I think it's more about creativity and simplicity. I think we wanna be in a really arts oriented place. Um, I wanna raise our kids in a really diverse environment. And so uh, really a friend of mine always says, you make the best decisions when your bravery just outweighs your fear, Ooh. right? You're, you're afraid and then all of a sudden you just get like a little, just enough bravery to kind of make the move. And that's, that's kind of what happened. And so we, sold our house and sold tons of our stuff and gave away a bunch of stuff and moved to an 825 square foot apartment. Um, And we love it. Like we totally love it. And um, I think now if we went back to a big house in the suburbs, we'd be like, where is everybody? We've gotten really used to living kind of right on top of each other. We get a lot of time together. We don't have to spend a lot of time managing our stuff because there isn't much stuff. It's been really great. That's it's been the a great thing, adventure. Is managing all the stuff. Mm-hmm. It's like the more, you know, I think was it big you said more money, more problems, yeah. right? But it's like the more stuff you have, the more you have to worry about. And that's that's a challenge. I mean, for someone like me, I love land. I love 
feeling the infinity of a yard, right? So I'm here mm-hmm. in Connecticut and I feel infinity here like you feel at the beach, right? I just see woods and I, I don't know how far out they go. I just know it goes out. And I love that feeling. It makes me so happy. But I also really envy people who live in small condos where you take the Swiffer and you're done in five minutes and your life is just so simple that you can just focus on everything your heart desires rather than, okay, I got the plumber coming today. I got the electrician coming tomorrow. Shit, this broke, that broke. Got to get the lawn mowed. I got to do this. I got to do that. And you're like, ah, it's such a conflicting thing. And so maybe it's the Gemini in me that wants both things. But um, I think there will be a time where I will do the same. Well, and I think it doesn't have to be like, we probably won't live here forever. I mean, we love it. I kind of hope we do, but, um, and it doesn't have to be the same for everyone. So like my husband and I, when we were, let's say like newly married, we were like 26, we moved to Michigan and we bought a big old house that was built in 1920 that needed to be like completely redone. And then we realized we don't know how to do anything and we don't like it. <laughs> like this is this is terrible. <laughs> we are the wrong candidates for this. We're like really, really great candidates for apartment living. You know, I, I like to live in a small space. I like that you can clean it up in 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. I can't fix anything, you know? Um, but it doesn't have to, there's no, that's another big part of this for me. There's no one right way for each of us for every season. A lot of what I'm really passionate about is having conversations about listening to uh, what our own lives are telling us, Mm -hmm. right? What's right for you in this season for your family? And it doesn't have to look exactly like your neighbors or exactly like my neighbors or, you know, we get to craft the lives that we feel really excited about, the things that feel meaningful to us, even if they don't matter to other people. Yeah. And and I love when you use the term seasons because it gives people um, permission to realize that This could just be a season. Like, why does everything have to be so finite? Why? I think even with your, with who you are, right? Like, we're always like, this is who I am. And it's like, well, why can't you grow? Why can't you be a little different? Why can't friends be friends in this season and not in the next season? It doesn't mean that you're a bad person. I've been having this conversation a lot with people lately where they feel guilt when the friendships have run their course. And I was like, well, haven't you heard of the analogy of like shaking the tree? Like, it's okay to move on. You don't have to be hateful. You don't have to be negative. You don't have to tell them that, well, you're this, 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 and this. And that's why we can't. It's like, no, it's a different season. Like, I'm interested in different things. And I want to be, you know, pursuing friendships with people who have those similar interests or whatever the case is. But when you use seasons, there's like a permission slip involved in there that I love. I think it's so helpful for us. Um... Yeah, to let ourselves try new things, to let ourselves fail, to let ourselves take risks. You know, if if you have to decide at like whatever age someone decides is like grown up age, right? Mm-hmm. And then you're like the cement is dried and you have to keep living that life forever. It feels really scary to me. Um, one of the things that we really loved um, about moving to the city. So my husband and I have never lived in a city. We visited lots of cities, but we've always lived in small towns and suburbs. And when we got here, there was just so much we didn't know how to do. We were just like rookies in every way. (laughs) And we made mistakes constantly. And we screwed things up constantly. My, I was like 30% of the time I could take the right subway. I mean, I just got lost constantly with my kids who even, I mean, I ended up in other boroughs. I could never get my laundry done. I always bought too many groceries and I couldn't (laughs) um, get them all up the stairs, you know, because I'm used to having like a car. Um, And at first it was really, really frustrating. And then it started to become really freeing. And we were like, we get to be learners again, right? If you can keep learning, life feels really exciting. Mm -hmm. If you can reframe it um, and it's not like I am failing every single day, but it's, I'm learning a new skill set every day. And we're, we're becoming more curious and more capable people. I think that's an exciting way to live. Absolutely. So, so cool. Um, you know, one of the things that um, you talk about is being okay with disappointing some people, right? So if you're choosing present over perfect, um, one of the notions I feel like women carry is that we have to be the perfect friend, the perfect mom, the perfect sister, the perfect everything. And that weight 
is very heavy on our shoulders and we don't want to disappoint anyone. Will you talk a little bit about your circles and how you kind of got to the place where you realize it's got to it's got to be okay for your sanity to disappoint people and how you choose that. Absolutely. I um I think a lot of us who find ourselves kind of exhausted, burnt out, frantic, uh, especially women, especially in kind of midlife. Um, it's because we've bought into several different cultural myths. And one of them is if you do everything exactly right, you will never disappoint anyone. Well, that's just a lie. The way it works is there's a certain amount of time and a certain amount of energy and it does run out, it is finite. And so some people, when you say yes to one thing, you are inherently saying yes, saying no to something else. And so the people that you're giving this time to are not the people that you're going to be giving this time to. It just, like it's math. So you have to decide if I'm gonna give up the myth that I can do it all for everyone. What that means is admitting the ugly reality that some people are gonna be disappointed, which is like terrifying for me. Mm -hmm. Like I hate that thought, but okay. If reality, as much as I don't like it, is that somebody's going to be disappointed, what that means is I get to decide who I'm going to disappoint and who I'm not. And so what I thought about is in this terrible new reality, who am I willing to disappoint and who am I unwilling to disappoint? And so I thought about it in terms of if you picture like a bullseye, picture like concentric circles and at the center it's my husband and I and our two boys. That's it. That's the center. And then it's like maybe my parents or a couple of very best friends. Then it's like my in-laws, extended family, really close friends. Then we're getting into like school friends, colleagues. Then we're like, you know, that lady I see sometimes at the playground. You go all the way out from there, right? Mm -hmm. The mistake I made for so many years was thinking if I managed to do things just absolutely perfectly, every person in all of these circles would always be happy. Yeah. But you're probably good enough where you did. Because I feel like I was pretty good at keeping everybody happy over here. And my circles are insane and filled with so many people. There's a lot of overcrowding in these circles. And then what you realize is you neglect the inner circle because and they'll take the it. That's the thing. That was a, a real moment of clarity for me, realizing that I was often giving the best of my energy to people in the circles that were further out. And I was forsaking the people in the center circle. And that's probably my biggest regret when I look back at that season of my life. Right now, I don't know if I'm getting, I'm certainly not getting everything right, but I know that I'm giving the best of my energy, the best of my soul, the best of my spirit to my husband and my kids uh, because I got close enough to that edge to get a little bit scared and I'm not doing that again. Mm. I know that the best of what I have to give, the best love, the most attentiveness, the most connection, that goes to those three people. And then whatever's left, which is a lot less than I previously thought, it goes to the people in the corresponding close circles. And it's terrifying sometimes to have to like look someone in the eye and say like, I am not going to do that thing or I am not gonna attend that event, or I am not going to sign up for that. That's hard for me. Mm -hmm. But it, it's, I'm getting better at disappointing people on the outer side, outsides of the circle because I'm so deeply committed to not doing it to my kids or to my husband anymore. I think that's incredible and such great perspective that we all need to focus on. And I wonder like when you make these circles, right? How do you, like in life, I feel like we're all here to help each other. Right. I think that that's, you know, that's how I approach life. And so if I can, I will, but I'll often overdo it because I think, I don't know, I think I have a superhero cape on my back. It's like invisible. And I think all women pretty much feel the same way. Totally. So how do you, how do you not kind of, you know, I mean, listen, I get the circles, but I still find it hard if I say no to Kelsey and she needs me when I need her one day, she's going to be like, sorry, peace out. You didn't help me. I can't help you. And so we do need each other. Right. Um, and if you just keep it so close, 
it's going to be challenging in life when, you know, your colleagues who now may have a job somewhere else and you want to reach out to them and get their help if you didn't show up for something that was important for them. But then what happens is you can get so overwhelmed. Like I was everywhere for everything, making sure I didn't disappoint people. Of course, I disappointed people along the way because you can really only do so much. But damn, I tried really hard. But yeah, you 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 hurt the people you're closest with. So how do you do well, you know what? How do we do it all? <laughs> <laughs> Shit, that's where that's I'm going back question. to. Oh, well, I think a couple things to think about are um, sort of like, what's the proportional amount of time or energy given all these circles, right? Like one of the things I get wrong, my husband teases me about this all the time. I could meet someone twice um, and spend like, you know, an hour with them total. And then I get a wedding invitation. I'm like, yeah, definitely. I am definitely flying to another part of the country Mm -hmm. to attend their wedding. I'm I'm definitely going to go to a shower. I'll probably host a shower. Like I go all the way. And my husband's like, you know, that person is essentially a stranger, right? Like you're, this is crazy town. So what I think about is like, who would I, who are the appropriate people for me to do that for, right? Fly across the country, host a shower, Mm sister-in-law, college roommate, right? A couple, but not lady I met on a plane. Yeah. There has to be some sort of like, um, I think that's where the circles are really helpful. You give the best and the most to the inside and then you give appropriately less and less to the outside. Doesn't mean nothing. I probably still keep the circles, keep too many people in the circles and do too much. The other thing that helps me is I ask myself, if I don't do this, who will? And oftentimes I'm taking a really great opportunity from someone else by trying to be that superhero in everybody's life, in everybody's business, right? So like nobody else can be a mom to my boys. That's my job. That's my jam. That's my greatest joy. But like, there are a lot of things in life that need to get done, but I don't have to be the one to do it. And somebody else might gain a lot of joy or meaning from doing that thing. Mm -hmm. If I pull back on my savior complex and let them do it a little bit, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I was just kind of thinking too, what I have done in the last four years when, you know, my mom got sick and we've been dealing with all this stuff is I started omitting things that were just overwhelming. And I was like, people who love me are going to love me despite like I cancel Christmas gifts. I was like, can't do Christmas cards, can't do Christmas gifts. I'm so sorry. Um, and then I did lessen a lot of the events and what I would do instead. So if someone wanted me to come to a charity event, I'd say, you know, I can't make it, but I can send something or I can do this. So I would tell them what I could do. So then, you know, you're still helping and you're still being, you know, gracious in that moment, but like doing what's within your ability at that time. So. And I think I think some of what that does is it keeps you healthier and more able to like in that season, you know, meet your mom's needs and be a, a, the family member that you needed to be. What it also does is it communicates to the other people in your life a little bit of permission to not say yes to everything as well, mm-hmm. right? It's so helpful for me when I'm around people who say stuff like that, who say like, hey, I totally care about this. I can only contribute in this way because of the other things I'm already um, committed to. I'm like, well, that person seems extremely sane and I want to be like them. <laughs> I so am I envious. It, it, totally. <laughs> but it's contagious. It lets yeah. us all make healthier decisions. So I think it's it's important for each of us and our own like health and lives and families. It's also a gift we give to the people around us to say like, I'm not going to pretend that it's okay to say yes to everything and then end up burnt out and exhausted. Yeah. I'm going to steward my own life and energy in a responsible and loving way. And I want to make it easier for you to do that too. I love that. Before we move on from that, do you guys have any questions? Because I feel like it's such an important topic that um, if I miss something, I don't want to miss it for our audience. So if you guys have any follow-ups to that. You know, I think Shauna, like as a young career person right now, and you know, I work in media, you worked in media, well, still work in media. Do you have advice for especially young people who want to put up boundaries um professionally and i'm in a fortunate position where i work for someone great where this isn't usually a problem but i know a lot of people it's where you can see that i'm in an interesting position right now oh yeah this on air but um, but (laughs) (laughs) but i'm wondering if you have advice for young people 
who want to draw boundaries, especially professionally on those outside circles, but still be respected and everything they need to be for their for their work? Mm. I think that's a great question. And I would say a couple different things. I would say, you know, um, we set people's expectations for us um, by the way that we communicate. So when I get an email from someone at three in the morning, I'm like, note to self, that person thinks I should be returning emails at three o'clock in the morning as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm not gonna do that, but in my 20s, I absolutely did, especially if I thought that, per if that person was kind of important in some way. Um, start now cultivating the habits of communication and interaction that show people I'm not, on my phone 24 hours a day. I'm not going to get back to you. You know, when, when someone returns your texts in four seconds all the time, then you've trained them, right? Say like, I literally live with my phone in my hand. So if there's ways for you to communicate clearly and consistently, that kind of thing. The other thing, it's always helpful for me to think about things as a long game. There's so much, especially in media, where it's like that very, like, if you say no, someone else is going to get it. And then like, they're going to be the next big thing and you miss the boat. For my life as as a writer, I want to be a writer till the day I die, and I hope that's a really long time from now. I'm not trying to do the next big thing right now. I'm trying to build something durable and beautiful for like the next 50 years. Mm. And if I miss out on a couple things right now, that's okay with me. Mm. If I burn out and risk my health and my family, that's not okay with me. Mm. So I always think about the long game. Well, it. such That's a great really example of that in our business is like actors who said no to massive roles, but they still had huge careers. Totally. I love those stories. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's challenging, though, for young people in the industry because I always have a hard time advising them because I would not be where I was if I didn't respond every second. And if I didn't hustle and if I didn't work 24-7, I would not have gotten to where I did because succeeding in any industry at the level you want to succeed at really requires a commitment that goes above and beyond what the other people are going to do, right? And so I find like when you're starting off, you have to give to get, you have to get there. And then what happens is at some point we all, we get over that kind of hump and then we can look at our lives in this season now and say, okay, well, I don't want to take on as many acting roles this this season, right? Like that's where like an Angelina Jolie becomes an international star. And she's like, yeah, I want to take a step back. I want to do just the meaningful projects. I want to start directing. Like you can't have it all, right? Like when you talk about even being envious of other people, so it doesn't mean that you're saying, okay, look at everything you're envious of and then shut down your life so that you can have that because there are consequences. You still got to pay your bills. You still got to go to work. Like what happens is it's such a challenge for us in our positions and at our age to advise young people because I don't know if Maria at 27 would be Maria 42 if she didn't do what she did then. Mm -hmm. That's where I'm very confused. I, I totally get what you're saying, absolutely. And I've had people say that, like, you know, like how lovely of for you to say now you're going to slow everything down yeah now that you've got a nice established relationship with a publisher now that you've got a nice contract absolutely i totally get that uh, maybe this is a little more um jaded i tend to think that um when you're on the younger side you take like one tenth of the advice you're given anyway so i'm going to go <laughs> ahead and say it and just trust that that's like great. I would say, especially, uh, especially in terms of dating, like whenever anyone asks me dating advice, I was like, you know what you're going to do, don't you? Yeah. You're not going to listen to me at all. Totally. Are you? So true. <laughs> there's, there's a lot about youth that's sort of indestructible and, and invincible. And so I'm happy to give advice, but I, I will absolutely still continue to get emails at three o'clock in the morning from people and be like, okay, that's fine. You can do that when yeah. you're 25. And you'll figure it out along the way. Yeah. I know. Well, it's interesting because my husband will get on me sometimes because he's like, you get so fruity on the show and you're like, oh, the universe is going to give you what you want. Blah, blah, blah. He's like, there's realities in life. You got to work hard. And so I have to temper myself sometimes because he's right. Like there is like no getting around. If you like, listen, there are different levels. If you say, mm, this is where I want to be, there's no you know, but if you want to be in the upper echelon of your field, whether it's in, you know, medical field or engineering or industry, there's just no getting around it. Mm -hmm. Right. 
And so it's 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 a challenge. It's fun to have that conversation too. So, but I, I think it also comes down to what you're willing to give up along the way, mm-hmm. right? So, Jeff, if your question was um, my highest or my only priority is my career, it's the mm. only thing I care about, and I want to be the absolute top of my field. Okay, then then yes, hold your phone in your hand for the rest of your life and never be unreachable, and and you can probably do that. But if you say I value my career very much and I'm going to work really, really hard. I also value my marriage and my core relationships. And so I'm going to find a way um, to give uh, the the appropriate amount to each of those things in their seasons and moments. That's a really different thing Mm -hmm. because some of what you wanted for your life was not just the work stuff. You wanted a marriage and a full life and, and, and fulfilling relationships. And so I think, it's important anytime we make decisions about our time, what is it you really want and what matters to you? And it's okay mm-hmm. if it's not the same as everybody else, yeah. but to acknowledge the things that matter most, I think helps us in making those hard decisions. And it's so never awesome. gonna be perfect, right? Like you're gonna have, like I always say, like ebbs and flows of like, we run red and then you you can you know always. go down. So it's like, Jeff, if anybody I know, like of anybody I know, I feel like you have been the most balanced Mm -hmm. and you've also grown and and um along your journey as well so like you hold your values in high regard already well that's good i um i really appreciate that and i think part of that is learning from the great people on this show and you know what's interesting shauna i feel like part of what you're saying is like your concentric circles can also change too like when you're in your young 20s maybe some of those professional relationships are a little closer than they will be Mm -hmm. as you age. Mm -hmm. But just being so intentional all the time, taking stock of those circles, taking stock of those values and pacing your future, really taking that intentionality to think about that's what's so important. There is a book that I am crazy about. Um, do you guys know Patrick Lencioni? No. no. Oh, he's a, he, he would be great on the show. He's so just a wonderful, lovely person. He's written several books on like the business side, of, business and leadership side of things. But then he wrote a, a book about, and of course I don't know the title off the top of my head, but it's something like the five questions every family should answer or that, but it, essentially there's this funny story that he tells that he's big into like, what are your priorities for your team? What are the goals that your team wants to meet in this quarter? What are the, you know, whatever. He's really good at that on a business level. And then his wife said to him at a certain point, if we ran, if you ran your business the way we run this family, you'd be out of business in in quarter one or something like that. And he realized that he didn't have the same kind of plan and strategy and, and value process for their family life that he had for his business life. And so they applied these principles to their family life. And it was so great and I would totally recommend it. But one of the things they talk about is understanding what this particular season is about and therefore not about. So like when I say, I don't reply to emails at three o'clock in the morning. Well, I absolutely do if it's the week of a book release. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course I do. Mm. Um, But I absolutely don't if in the seasons when I had a newborn and that was the most important thing in my life. And so I think it's mm. it's really good to get clear on what matters most in this season and to let it shift, to give the best of what you have for the particular thing that you're working toward right then. That Oof. is perfect, even though we're not aiming for perfect, but I think <laughs> that is such a great way to explain that. Mm-hmm. Ugh, drop the mic. I have a quick question, Shauna. Mm-hmm. How... How many, okay, if you have a ton of things you value, what would you say is like the perfect amount, right? Because I feel like if you have four or five things, I'm like, I love this, I value this, I value this. You can't do it all, right? Mm -hmm. And I feel like you two were both talking about this at the beginning, being a female. It's like, no, we can, we have to do it all. How do you go about like being selective with your values? That's a great question. Um, And I I would say... Uh, pay attention. Uh, uh, pay attention to a couple things, right? Pay attention to your own jealousy and desire. Um, one thing that helped me many years ago uh, was making a list, uh, sort of in the opposite direction, of things that for this particular season I don't do. Mm. Like I just, you know, I wanted to do one million different things, and I had to just say, I just had to draw some lines. Here's what I don't do. And when I looked at that list, it gave me a little freedom to say. I'm, I'm acknowledging that I am not going to get everything done in this season. 
um, and I'm going to let myself be okay with that. Um, and it sounded like a little bit of a silly list, but like in this season right now, I don't do any sort of like formal cardio or weightlifting. And I just figure like walking around New York City and getting my groceries up the stairs is going to have to be enough for now. And maybe in another season, I'll do that in a really specific way. For a long time, I had a very strict no baking policy. I don't know how to do it. I'm not good at science. I mess it up all the time. I don't have the time and mental space in my life to learn this thing. So until I was like, you know, 40, I never did. And now I have kids and they like to like bake cookies and stuff. And so now I do. Mm. But it's okay to say, I also don't make my bed. Like not ever, ever in my life. It looks like a dorm room in here. If you, if I turned around the camera, it's like, I don't even know. Oh I just no, don't do like it. a Kelsey cheering over here. I'm trying to get her to make her bed. <laughs> like Kelsey, you got to make your bed. Your life will be so much happier. I totally get it. I People do it. People love it. It makes them feel good about their day. It categorically, categorically doesn't matter to me. If I make my bed or don't make my bed, it doesn't make me feel better about anything in the world. <laughs> oh, so I just don't. my God. <laughs> right there with you. <laughs> Dead. That's hilarious. That's funny. Well, Shauna, this has been such a great conversation. I've gotten so much out of it. Um, I'm feverishly taking notes here. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. I feel like we need to do um, another part to this because there's so much more to get into, um, even with, you know, faith and stuff. So um, hopefully you'll grace us with another presence at some point. Anytime. This has been so fun. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, my God. I, there's so many big aha moments mm-hmm. I got to have in this episode that I'm going to have to listen back to my to the whole thing myself as just a, a listener. Um, so I can't thank you enough. If you guys want to um, get the book, it's called Present Over Perfect. Um, if you want to find more about Shauna, you can hit her website, shaunaniquest.com. We will put that in the summary of this episode, so you can just click. Um, and you can follow her on social media, at shaunaniquest. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. All right, guys. Holy moly. I mean, wow. there's like so many moments. She's Kelsey's so awesome. never making her bed again. That's <laughs> no, it. No, it's, it's so It's fun. over. <laughs> it's so, it's, it's, it's it's funny that she says that because a lot of the things you try and teach me and you have been telling me, I totally get like the wiping down my space and this and that. The bed thing, I'm the same way. I'm like, and to me, it's like I, the easiest thing. You just pull the corners, boom, done. It's easy, but it's like I never go in there. So yeah. like it doesn't even, it, psh, right you over really my head. don't go in there. No. I go in there. Yeah. I go into my room a lot. Yeah. And I never have been a room person. I don't like going, mm. it's like not my space. So, so funny. I know that okay, was funny, but, but she's amazing. Stupid she's, shit aside, yeah, 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 yeah. The, <laughs> the important shit. Um, I feel like, like the seasons oh my and what you do and you don't do. Um, I marked so many things here for social media for you guys, but man, I really that was so good. And ooh. the way she explained, finally, kind of that, you know, yes, like in an important moment, she is going to answer that email at three o'clock in the morning, like you know it's like there's no way you can't sometimes right and so um like right in this season right now in this season I'm checking emails more than I was in my last season why because there's a few more things happening and so now I'm having to pay a little bit more attention to it but I have an email that tells you I'm not checking emails right and in this season I am a little bit more engaged in social media Um, But in the last season, I wasn't. So I think it's so great to free ourselves of the what I am and what I'm not to kind of just, this is what's important to me in this time, Mm. right? Like if we have kids, like there's going to be a shifting of priorities in that time. And then eventually maybe they'll swing the other way again. I don't know. Yeah. I get suspicious of those people who are like, I never answer emails after 6 p.m. Because like, I get that maybe like most of the time you don't, but to hear the author of the book present over perfect say like there might be a week out of the year where i do do that right. it's just not my mo i think mm-hmm. that's so important yeah i think there's like baseline things like baseline boundaries mm-hmm. that you have to have in life yep and then you choose like she said who you might cross that boundary list for and for what reason right um so i think like i've be- tried to become more intentional about not um 
not texting people at all hours of the night or whatever. Like if I get a thought, like it's hard. I used to just dump it. And now I'm like, okay, I'll just put it in my email and then I'll save it and then I'll send it at a more appropriate time. I really am trying to be better at that. And that's been a a little journey for a while now. I have to tell you that I love that and I appreciate that because with old bosses, that used to make me so crazy because it would be like 12 and I'm like, Ah, then it, I'm sitting on it and I'm like now I don't know what to do with it but I see it from both sides I do because it's like you have to dump it out of your you head have to. but there's a way to do it like Correct. but I didn't yeah. know because I was under those systems too where yeah. that's who I was learning from yep. so I thought it was just this is how it's done like yep. don't answer it if you can't answer it but mm-hmm. but you do answer it and then if you don't respond right then then you lose it yep. and so yep. you know now I've become more intentional about how I approach that stuff mm-hmm. and I think listen, we're all on a journey and that's why we're trying to get better every day. And so when you know better, you do better and you get better. So that is our show for today. Hope you guys have um, an amazing day. I hope you guys enjoyed this. If it was helpful, share it with some friends. Um, I know this episode was helpful for me. So um, please share it with your friends on social media, email, talk to them about it. Um, I think there's some really important takeaway here for everybody to benefit from. Um, if you liked this episode, check out episode number 117 with Shauna's friend, Glennon Doyle, who we love, who also stresses the importance of finding your own way. And later this week, we're going to be featuring award-winning TV film actress, Brittany Snow and her creative partner to discuss their new mental health initiative, the September letter, which I am very excited about. So stick with us guys. We're going to be here every day. Yay. <laughs> Yay. In the meantime, follow us at Shauna Nequest at better together with Maria at Jeffrey Crane Graham at Kel Smyer too. And remember, 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 be nice people, make good choices and be present. <laughs>